Hello AP Calc students, this is Mr. Record and we're taking a look at our example number 8 from topic 6.2. Still talking about this idea of the trapezoid, trapezoidal sum, but now we're going to apply it to a real world context. And I am just crying tears of joy here because we're going to be able to calculate the distance traveled by a cyclist. Let's take a look at example 8. So what we've got here is the following table that shows the speed in miles per hour of a cyclist at various times. And as you can see, uh, at zero minutes, we caught this cyclist traveling at 33 miles per hour, pretty fast, probably going downhill. And then at time two, we have a different speed at time five. At time six, things are slowing down. Maybe they uh, are getting a little bit more tired. At time nine, they pick speed up a little bit, but Ooh, at time 10, they must be going up a really steep incline to go 5 miles per hour. And then we f have our final speed at time 12. Well, even though we are only to find, able to find like a few discrete speeds at some various instances, we could still use some kind of a approximation technique and find the total distance in miles that the cyclist travels during this 12 minute time interval. And we're going to use, as it says, the trapezoidal approximation. So let's take a look. We know that the area using trapezoid approximation will be an approximate value. Now Remember from the previous video, we had this very elaborate formula called the trapezoid rule that I said that you don't need to memorize. Well, as it turns out, that formula will be completely useless in this question. And this is more commonly the kinds of questions that you would see on the AP exam. And the reason why that formula is useless is because if you look very closely at the time intervals here, as you move from one box to the next, they are not consistent. Notice I have a two minute interval followed by a three minute interval followed by a one minute interval. And then there's another three, a one, and a two. And it's those values that would make up the height of each of these trapezoids. And if the height's not consistent, you do not have a B minus A over N that you can factor out in front and therefore that whole trapezoid formula goes by the wayside. But fear not, because if you know the formula for finding one trapezoid, you can finish this off because you're going to end up finding the formula for one, two, three, four, five, six different trapezoids in this problem. So how do we do that? Well, trapezoid number one, we know starts with a one half times the sum of the bases. And for that matter, every single trapezoid will have a one half as part of its formula. So why don't we just write that one time in front and we never have to worry about doing it again. It's going to save time and space. So we do know we have to take the sum of the bases now the bases are going to be the two speed values. Those are the dependent values. Those are the heights of those two vertical segments that would extend up if we were to graph this thing. So we'd have 33 plus 25. And each of those, or that particular sum, would be multiplied by the height here, 2. And there's your first of your six trapezoids. So we'll keep doing that with these other values. 25 gets used again, add to 27, and we now use a height of 3. 27 is going to get used again, add it to 13, and now we have a height of 1. 13 will get used again, add to 21, multiply by the height of 3. 21 gets used again, plus 5, multiply by a height of 1, and just not quite enough space, but I'll continue down here with our 5 plus 9. That'll be multiplied by the height of 2. And basically, there's your setup. The rest of it's pretty easy. You just got to do some arithmetic. Let's go ahead and finish this up. Uh, this problem would certainly allow you the use of a calculator. So we'll say 33 plus 25 is 58. 58 times 2 is 116. Now I'm reading these values fairly quickly because I'm not going to enter this in a calculator because I think you can pretty much push those buttons. 
uh, 25 and 27 is 52. 52 times 3 is 156. 27 and 13 is 40. Multiply by 1 stays as a 40. 13 and 21. 34 times 3. 34 times 3, I believe, is 102. And then we finish up with 26 plus 14 times 2, which is 28. And then lastly, when we combine all of the values inside the brackets, uh, they add up to be 468. And half of that, of course, is 234. So we start to think about this. The distance the cyclist traveled in 12 minutes is 234. 234 what? That's a good question. Let's see. Speed was miles per hour, 234 miles in 12 minutes? That's pretty fast, isn't it? Well, we got to be careful here because the units on this problem are going to be the product of these two labels. We have miles per hour times minutes, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't really communicate distance here. So what you're going to have to do is do your factoring and labeling method here and have your miles on top over one hour and multiply that by something that has a minute in the denominator so that we could cancel it with the minute that we have outside. So this minute right here corresponds to that minute. What I've written here is a fraction that should be equivalent, uh, hopefully will be equivalent to uh, one and we could use one hour here is to 60 minutes and at this stage you can see that your hours cancel your minute labels cancel and if you just take 234 um, and i tell you what i'm going to put an mi there so that looks more like miles and not meters so if you take your 234 and you divide it by 60 uh, the calculator will give you 3.9 and now you have miles as your units and that's what we wanted and that's a lot more reasonable the cyclist could go about four miles in that 12 minutes it's still a pretty fast cyclist though now note a couple of things here first of all as far as this uh, labeling is concerned if those of you saw that this is not a very compatible set of units right off the bat you could have converted these minutes to hours immediately wouldn't have been tough right zero minutes zero hours two minutes would be two out of 60 or one out of 30 one thirtieth of an hour etc etc but if you decided to do that you would have had some pretty icky looking fractions in these positions where the height was that might have made the problem just a little bit trickier but you could have done that but you could also obviously do what we did and convert at the end. Just make sure you know what your conversion procedure is. And then lastly, one more time, notice that the distance between your given values of t do not have to be equal, and they certainly were not equal here. This is sometimes going to be true when you do your rectangular Riemann sums from a table of values. It's often the case on the AP exam, and you're going to have plenty of opportunities throughout the rest of the course to see some examples like that. Hope this helps a little bit understand the trapezoid rule just a little bit better. As always, we thank you for joining. We'll see you next time.